Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce Greg to the stage. Uh, he's going to discuss an experiment he did, um, how to use Evernote as an informational threat intelligent management platform. So let's hear it up for Grex. Thank you. Oop. Thanks. All right, testing, is this on? Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, yeah, so um, this is just a little experiment that I did. Uh, been working on it for about a year now, but um, basically uh, trying to use some of the stuff that I learned at work, but try to use it for my own purposes at home. Um, so first, my typical disclaimer. Um, so I have about 20 years in uh, the industry. About 16 of those have been focused uh, specifically in information security. In the past five years, I've been more in an operational environment uh, in, a, in a security operations center, either helping them you know, move to the next level or, or, or at least initially working as an an analyst. Um, and so I, and, and, and as part of that, I also do a, a lot of training currently with incident response. Um, but as you can see, I've you know, done a lot of security engineering stuff. If you're from the US, there's, there's FISMA, which is government compliance, uh, worked proposals, did trade studies, you know, all the way up to what I'm doing now. So I've done a lot. <laughs> Um, so the things that I want to focus on today was just a background of why, why, I, why I did this. Why am I trying to use Evernote to generate threat intelligence, right? Um, so kind of the contributing factors to that is a little bit of dashboarding. Uh, the, the secret weapon, does anybody here know what I'm talking about when I say the secret weapon? Okay, that's good. So we'll learn a little bit about that. Uh, and then also silos of threat excellence. Um, so, uh, you know, really just taking a quick look at what threat intel is and isn't. Um, and then merging those three things into using Evernote so to manage all that data so that you can generate threat intelligence to help you defend your network. In the example that I'm going to be using, it's more of a focus on, you know, you run a website, so it's fairly sim simple. But, um, you know, obvious, obviously you're going to have scaling issues with the Evernote once you reach a certain size. But, you know, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is that the lessons learned, uh, the lessons that you learn through trying to create something through Evernote, you can, you know, uh, use uh, either open source or commercial solutions to be able to scale that. Um, so the background, um, at least in the sector that I work, we have a huge tendency to overcomplicate things. We will take a simple idea and we will try to build uh, and, and, and they will go through like a whole system development life cycle to build this idea. So you start out with requirements and then from that you go, go through the whole development process and finally delivering it. Usually, in the end, uh, what's created isn't what helps meet, uh, it, it doesn't help the people that we built the solution or the product for. Uh, and primarily, that's because it's built on requirements that were developed like a year, a year and a half back. So whenever the solution finally gets out there, their, their requirements essentially have changed. So obviously we've, uh, at least some of the smaller groups have transitioned to doing more of an agile development process. Um, but I'm more of a, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So the whole KISS prin principle, don't try to overcomplicate things. You know, try to use the tools that you already have in, in, in uh, different ways so that you can meet those specific needs. So the example that I give is, is, is there was a workflow system that someone was building for hiring new people. What happened, um, you know, they developed the requirements for it. They built this whole thing a year and a half later. You know, I, I went back to the manager. They, I, I had since left, but I went back to the manager and I asked them, 
um, you know, well, how's, how's that hiring workflow system going? And, and she said that basically that no one's using it, you know, because they built this whole system and it wasn't usable by the time the system was built. So another principle and kind of related to that is, you know, build, at least try to, before you buy, um, and, and, or you, uh, and then by buy, that could be also setting up a whole, pr uh, a, a whole development project as well. Um, but use the resources that you have in-house, you know, the quick and dirty solutions, because a lot of times uh, you already have the tools and, and the capabilities and the resources uh, available, but if you just use them in a slightly different way, may, maybe focus more on uh, the tools may not have the exact capability that you want, but maybe set up processes to help con control that so that people use the tools in the right way. And the whole thing here is that usually if you do a quick and dirty solution, it, it's going to be maybe 60% of what you need. And that's something that you can use now. And the best part of this is at the end of that period, um, you will understand what you really need. So whenever you build it first, you determine what those true requ requirements are. Maybe that eventual solution, that quick and dirty solution, will meet your needs and you're happy with that. If it doesn't, at least you know what you really need so that you can partner with, with uh, commercial entities to look at solutions that are out there or maybe develop a, a whole entire, or bring in a whole development team to, to build like a, a um, fully life-cycled solution. I think the emphasis here, and, and this is something that Dave Kennedy mentioned in the keynote this morning, all, was to focus on the people. I, I'm sorta of augmenting that some where, you know, focus on the people and, and the process first to determine what you really need, because you may not need that expensive so solution. Using the resources you already have, um, that may be good enough, that quick and dirty solution. But if it doesn't, then you can go to building an entire product or s alternative solution or partnering with uh, some of the different software solutions that are out there, but at least you'll know what your gaps are, and so you can pick the product that that fill that fills those specific niches. Um, so the case in in point was Threat Intel Services, and if anybody saw Chris Nickerson's talk yesterday morning, you know one of the points that he emphasized was was um, um, uh, among a bunch of other things was to you know bring your threat intel services in-house. And I'm gonna explain why here. Um, so getting back to the problem that I was trying to solve is I was working as an analyst. Um, I was looking to take advantage of, of all this open source in Intel, but it was very difficult because I would have to go to like 10 sites and search on this IP. I mean, you, you could Google it and you could get some of that stuff, stuff back, but um, what I was really looking for was, you know, a repository of where all that information is um, so that I can search it and, and trend it over, over time. Um, so the restrictions that I had, this was just sort of a solo project, so I wanted to take all this open source intel and I wanted to put it in a bucket. And it had to be you know, the organization wasn't going to supply this for me because that would be like a year-long process just to buy like a server and set it up with something. Um, so the organization wasn't going to provide it for me. And, and, and like, obviously, there would be no option to build something internally. So I wanted to build my own, obviously hosted externally, but I wanted something that I could access from the in, inside. So the specific requirements that I was looking for was just a big bucket of, that I could just dump all this data into. So things like blog feeds or other type feeds, data-driven feeds. So if you think of like the shadow server feeds that, that push out 
um, indicators or IPs on a regular basis. Data files, so these are those blacklists that are out there so that you can, um, you know, the blacklist of sites that you shouldn't go to or blacklisted IPs or domains. And then anything else, you know, maybe I'm, you know, some vendor puts out a great threat Intel report on, on the next APT, right? Well, you know, I want to grab that and just throw it into the system too. You know, and having everything into this one system where I can do one search and I can find everything out about that. Um, so obviously I wanted it to be searchable. I wanted to have a way to categorize things. And I think one of the most important things is I wanted a tagging capability which serves as an alternative kind of table of contents or categorical view so that you can view data in different ways, basically creating hierarchies of tags for what you want to see. Um, and I wanted something that was cloud-based be because I'm lazy and I didn't want to have to like spin up the server and patch it and maintain it. Um, and one thing to point out here, because I've given this presentation one other time, and, and I think I'm, I'm looking at this from an analyst point of view. So an alert pops up, and then I want to go to my threat intel, my open source thing, and I want to search for maybe that IP or that string so I can find stuff out about it, which, which is different from taking a bunch of these threat intel feeds and then mer merging them through sticks and taxi and stuff like that and automatically deploying them to your IDSs, IPSs, or firewalls. So it was more focused on, and getting back to what Dave said this morning, it was more focused on helping the people do their job. Um, so just a little bit of background, um, the dashboarding stuff. So this is basically where kind of one of the seeds that started this project up. I, I was assigned, I was a security engineer several years back, and I was assigned to develop a dashboard for executives. Um, so the method that, it, that I used was I just used risk, and, and, uh, and, and, and then the two components was vulnerability and threat. And so I basically created like a few tabs on this dashboard. So there was like an overall tab, and there was a vulnerability tab, and, and uh, there and there was a um, threat tab, and, and, and so I came up with some generic data sources so that you know the executives could get a feel for hey what's going on out there on the internet. Um, so there were some you know uh, other sources that I used there, so it's no secret. Um, but then we we also had our internal tools, which I can't talk about here, um, that would scan and give us. Uh, data like 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 what the um, uh, what patch level we were at. So combine that all together and just to create a nice dashboard. But the one thing that I learned from that are some great resources. These and and, and this was about five six years ago. So um, so whenever I left that job, I really liked being able to keep up to date. So when I left, I was able to create something better because I wasn't re restricted to using SharePoint. <laughs> um, so I basically took all those feeds that I learned about and I used Google Reader, you know, rest in peace. And I, with Google Reader, you could group feeds and then those groups, you could build gadgets which would show up on your iGoogle page. Um, so it sort of looked like that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, Google Reader went away. A few months later, iGoogle went away. So um, I get, and there were a lot of other solutions that were trying to fill that need. So I went to Feedly, and so I kind of used, used that, and that was nice, but it didn't give me that dashboard type look that I was looking for. So the eventual solution that I'm currently using today is uh, NetVibes, and, and they have a paid version and a free version, and of course I'm using the free version. Um, so I basically took a lot of those lessons learned and added the feeds to kind of create this cyber intel dashboard. But one of the things that I learned about dashboards was that 
they're nice for you know blog post feeds. So if if somebody comes out with with an awesome blog post and you're just trying to keep up with stuff. So if or if it's a vulnerability database that you're subscribed to, there's a lot of um, you know just as long as there's a few postings per day or a few items that appear in that feed, it, it generally works nice and you can go in and check your dashboard and you can kind of stay up to date with what's going on. But the data-driven feeds, so these are the feeds where you just get tons of IPs coming out or IPs or domains or whatever in indicator you want to use, those were changing too fast. So it wasn't really that useful. And, and so it dawned on me like, well, I need something to store all that information in so that I can later do analysis on it if I wanted to. Now Feedly and, and NetVibes both have a, a solution that you can pay for that helps you, you can kind of use them as a bucket service. Um, so you might want to check that out. But um, and the other thing is it didn't work for periodically updated data files. So if you're thinking some, some of those blacklists that it, it's a single text file and that you would download on a regular basis. So it didn't work well on storing that data. But like I said, one of the, you know, the takeaways here is that I identified many great resources of, in, of information to collect. Okay, so the secret weapon. So does everybody know what getting things done is, GTD? Does anybody use that? So it's a task management, or task management, it, it, it's a, you know, just a, it's an advanced to-do list, and there's a whole methodology behind it. So the secret weapon is essentially using Evernote uh, to implement getting things done. But the key takeaways that I got from experimenting with this, and I never really thought about it, because if you use Evernote, you, you just think of like, oh, it's just, you know, I can create notebooks, I can put notes there, blah, blah, blah. But if you step back and take a look at it, you know, think of Evernote as a database, you know, where a notebook is a table and a note is a freeform record, essentially. So following the GTD method, they basically, they have uh, the note, they have a, a specific, you know, getting things done notebook sort of segmented off so, so um, that it didn't, uh, you could nest notebooks so that, so that all your GTD stuff would just be in one part and not interfere with the rest of them. And they really used this hierarchical tagging. So they really went kind of the who, what, when, where. And you could define things like, you know, what would be sp specific projects, when would be the importance from, you know, hey, I have to do this now or daily to stuff I have to do now to stuff I have to do, you know, maybe next week. And then where, you know, if you're going to do it at home, work. And then also who that task re relates to. And then what you can do is you can create searches and you can save these so that you can, um, you know, look for, hey, give me all the stuff I have to do today at work. And then that would just pop up, kind of. And so this is what, this is from their website. And so this is their, you know, what, when, where, who. So they have... Uh, their methodology, methodology is a little different, but you know, there's daily, now, next, for, for when, and then where, then who it relates to, and then what are your projects. So one of the things with GTD is it's more of just a framework and you can customize it to what, what your needs are. So you know, this is my method where I, you know, I use uh, zero for daily and you know, one for stuff I gotta focus on now, two next, et cetera. And then I usually have a separation of there's like community things that I do, things like, you know, come to BrewCon. Um, there's stuff that I do for work, obviously. And then there's personal stuff. Hey, I gotta, you know, mow the grass, right? And then where, so there's a similar grouping there and then who focuses on if, if that task is something that I have to uh, partner with someone else on. And I was talking about how you could create shortcuts. So this is what my shortcut, so I don't have to, like if I want to find out what am I do, what do I have to do today at home? Like I don't necessarily have to, you know, build this complex query. I, I can basically create this query once and then I can say, 
save it so I can be like, I can select this and it'll show me all the stuff that I have to do right now at work, etc. So once you set it up, it's pretty easy to use. Um, <laughs> so part two, uh, or, or, or well, this is the third part. This is the, 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 the third input that led to using Evernote as a threat intelligence management system. Um, so over the past few years, obviously we, we all know that threat intel market has been growing. Um, so I started investigating, you know, what is threat intel? And so I've seen a little bit of it from an open source perspective and, and I've worked with some of the vendors to see what data they provide. Um, but I talked to experts and, and other folks just, just to get their perspective as well. And my basic takeaways are is that it's a very you know, interesting area where you're taking a single piece of data and you're uh, doing a lot of mathematical transforms and all this fancy stuff, right? And just, you know, it's very interesting. But the, but the big question is, you know, how much value is it? You know, um, and and one of my friends, he basically—I don't know if I should say his name—but if he, I have to find if he ever tweeted it, then I can just list his tweet there. But what he basically said was that if you're in information su security and you follow the right people on Twitter, that you know there's really not much value add for commercial then or com commercial threat intel services. Now that's his pers pers perspective. Um, so I, so in, in my investigation of what threat intel was, I, like, I was trying to figure out why is it not useful to us. So is everyone familiar with this or have seen this, the Pyramid of Pain by David Bianco? So he basically said, you know, these are all your different indicators types. You know, and, and obviously like hash values, IP, domain names, net, network and host artifacts. I mean, those, those are fairly easy to get. You know, but are they like high, are they high value, medium value, what, whatever. So what I really came to the conclusion of is that, you know, what threat intel vendors are selling isn't threat intel. It's, it's threat data. And, you know, and, and, and there was a good article that Rob Lee put together a few years back called An Introduction to Cyber Intelligence, but he references some US government document where they talk about this is the um, intel, intelligence life cycle. So you would do this planning and direction, collection, processing, and exploitation, et cetera. It, Etc. So theoretically, you would take all this da data and you would suck it in and go through this whole process, and then maybe, maybe you would get this this trickle of real threat intelligence, which maps to traditional adversary t TTPs. So how is this relevant? Anybody? So just a little analogy. Um, so I, this circle represents a bottle of, or the scope, or the body of threat data slash intel, whatever you want to call it. This is your organization. So maybe there's a smidgen of overlap there. So you're buying this massive amount of data, but most of it is irrelevant. Most of it is setting off your IDS sensors, your IPSs, your firewalls, your proxies, for stuff that isn't even relevant to you. Ideally, you would want something like this, right? You, you want, hey, I'm gonna buy this group of threat intel, and, and it's gonna be mostly relevant to us. And so this is what Chris Nickerson said yesterday morning, was that you know when you're dealing with threat Intel, it's definitely to take it in-house first. So just quickly defining what threat Intel is or the different buckets. Um, so we just have 
open source Intel. I think we all know what that is. So there's information sharing. So it's data as you'll, you'll join mailing lists or bulletin boards or whatever, and you can share information there. Log collection is huge. So, you know, most people are familiar with the logger. You know, being able to have this data available so that you can search retroactively. Having a sim of some, some sort to both, you know, make sense of that log data as well as pull in all your uh, alerts and be able to correlate them together for stuff you have to investigate. And then lastly, you know, something that pe people don't focus too much on is case tracking. You know, coming up with a case management system so that you can have a history of all the cases that you've worked on and so that you can go back and look through that. So this is where Evernote finally comes in. So I basically, you know, came and I, I said, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at the experiences that I did dashboarding. I'm going to look at what I learned from implementing this secret weapon thing, right? And then I'm going to take what I learned about threat intel, and I just want to push that all in and, and use Evernote as, as my threat intelligence management system. Um, so you can define notebooks and a hierarchy of tags. Um, you can, this is perfect because it's open and flexible, right? So if you want to change it, almost anybody can just go and change it. You could have the manager could go and in, in change it. You don't have a, you don't need a whole team to uh, manage your remedy solution. Um, and it's easy to use over the heavy database slash workflow management systems. And it's really simple. You just like take all the stuff that you have and you set up some automation and you start dumping stuff into it. Like you don't really, you really don't, don't care. The most important thing is so that you can dump it into one place so that as an analyst, I can go and search it later. Um, so um, just brief, what, where I focused most of my time was on trying to pull in the open source Intel. Um, so just an archive that an organization could search. So like I said earlier, earlier an alert pops, you get uh, something off that, like an IP, domain, whatever, you can search through this repository that you have. So the benefits is, you know, you can search this and you can pivot around. And you can also do an annotation. So although maybe these notes got created automatically, you know, you can really go in and write stuff like, oh, this is, this is not a good uh, entry, you know, ignore this. So you kind of have a history and you can document what your whole, uh, the value of that particular in indicator. So you can do auto, if, um, you can dump, get your da data in through feeds and a little bit of automation. And the other thing too is if you come across some, something cool on the web, I can just, you know, there's browser plugins where I can just click that and bam, it goes off to my Evernote threat intel database. Um, and then lastly, you need a recommended tagging structure. So I don't want to go too, like you don't want your tagging structure to be too prescriptive, but just kind of a framework essentially to, fo to follow. And that's what the secret weapon kind of gave me. So from OS, from an OS in pers perspective, these, these are some of the um, things that I started out. So I'm, I'm still using that same, trying to evaluate what my risk is through you know, having certain threat feeds and vulnerability feeds, and also si situational awareness feeds. So these could be just um, you know, this particular threat brief feed, or the ISC blog, or, or just like a news site related to security. So that if you find something and it happened like two months back, you can actually go back and say, well, what was, you know, news-wise, what was going on around that time? So it can give you better context. Um, so this is essentially what it look, looked like. Um, so I have, uh, as you can tell, so I'm using the, um, the, the who, so these are the sources. And then some of these sources have multiple feeds, and, and, and the feeds are essentially here. So, but the question is, is how do I get all this data into Evernote? 
So first of all, Evernote gives you an email that you can, like, like a randomized thing. And so you could sign up for whatever just using that email. Although I wouldn't recommend it because that email is supposed to be kept secret. So probably wouldn't do that. I think a better method is use uh, if this, then that, right? Is everybody familiar with that? I mean, just awesome tool. It's easy to implement. Um, from an RSS perspective, you are limited because usually, you know, news articles or whatever, you're only going to get part of it. Um, so you could, you know, change that up and write a little scraper. Or there's a tool, an inexpensive tool called Five Filter that that I found that you could set up, and it basically turns your partial feeds into uh, full content feeds. Obviously, so if then using this with Twitter, so there's a lot of Twitter bots out there that are connected to honeypots, and you can just you know watch them tweet and suck that data in, creating a new note for every tweet. And email integration, especially like in my case, I use Gmail. So I basically put a rule there saying, hey, if anybody, if I get an email where the subject is this or from this person or whatever, you know, store a copy of, of that off in, Internet, in Evernote. There's um, Stormstack, which is, I haven't used it personally, but it's been recommended to me as sort of an open source clone of if this, then that. But lastly, there's going to have to be some scripts, because um, ever if then if this, then that only takes you so far. So you're going to maybe have some scripts, especially for those blacklist files that I was talking about. Um, there's, there doesn't seem to be a, a good way to bring those in yet. So, so for those that have, have, have never seen if, if this, then that, um, but it's basically you come up with a recipe title, and here I was importing the SSH brute, which is a Twitter guy that, or a Twitter bot that collects um, brute force attempts against SSH. Um, so I basically say, hey, a new tweet by this user, and then you can use these res reserve tags like username and text to, you know, put it in the title, and then the body you can put whatever. And then I say the notebook that I want to put in, and then these tags. Uh, and, and these little symbols before the tags, essentially those are, that's something that um, uh, the secret weapon recommends. So you don't have to use those tags, but they're essentially like reserved, like special reserved tags. And they're related to the who, what, when, where uh, things. And then this was a little script that I'm, I'm on the Nova Hackers email list, if anybody does. Um, so I, I live right in the, in the DC area, and one of the groups there are the Nova Hackers, which I've been part of for the past several years. So I shot, what I was trying to do was pull a, um, one of those blacklist files and then email it to myself. So this is just a simple script that there, a guy wrote, a, um, uh, Amir wrote, a uh, little script because I'm not I haven't coded in like 15 years, but um, but then I knew enough where I went and kind of cleaned it up some and, and got it to do what I wanted it. So it essentially goes goes out there. In this case, it's looking at for at the malware domains and it checks it, ha hashes it, sees if the hash has changed since the previous time that I downloaded it. If it's if it's changed, then it sends it off to Evernote and saves the new hash. If, 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 if it hasn't changed, then, then it just logs it and moves on. So just, just set that up with a simple cron script. Um, but one of the big things is, you know, a lot of the research, or a, a lot of the focus has been on open source data, or in Intel, but some other aspects that I talked about. So we talked about information sharing. So this could be, something as simple as just a shared notebook. So in Evernote, I can create a notebook and I can just share it out with my partners. And then whenever we come across something interesting, we just post a new note. And in, it's just a note, so they, you can go in there and add, add comments about it. So it's a very simple system. So there's log collection, although, you know, it definitely wouldn't work on huge 
on, on a huge enterprise, at least for my cases, I just had my web server logs. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, hey, well, I want to go through my web server logs. And so I basically said, all right, I'll go through. And I wrote a little script that just parses out the web server, server logs for that particular day. And it runs each night. And it sends it off to Evernote. So now I have that log information available. Um, using it as a SIM, so not a, a true SIM, but more or less there are specific things that I'm looking for, like, hey, are people trying to brute force log in to my WordPress site? Or are there, have, have any files changed on uh, within the, your CMS di directory? And so there's a few kind of custom things that I wrote for that. And before, I would just get emails about it, but I wouldn't necessarily do anything with it. But what I, what, what I did was I changed it to push it to a SIM notebook so that at least I had kind of one place where I could see all the alerts and do more trending. And then from there, I could go back to my logs, right, and, and see what was going on. So it's a nice little quick way to, um, to do analysis. And the other thing is, I, I guess, so there's four inputs that I focus on, but there's also some analysis aspects of that too. So really, uh, case tracking, right? So this could just be a notebook, right? It's case tracking notebook. And then you could have tags for open, working, closed, right? And so, and then you could create custom searches for, uh, hey, show me all the open cases, the working cases, the closed, or, you know, and, it, and if you don't like these three categories, you just come up with a new one. You know, hey, there's, there's in review, right? And I mean, that's something that's fairly easy that anyone could just add. Um, so some other ideas is you could create a notebook for your indicator database. So um, the true things that you find that are um, focused on, like if you're focusing on advanced uh, attacks, right? And, and, I mean, and, and basically from that, maybe you could drive like a campaign database. Maybe from that, you could drive an adversary database, essentially, which is a collection of everything associated with a certain adversary, which essentially are the TTPs, which is that top tier in the pyramid. Um, so how do you find all this? So we talked about it. You know, we have tags. There's a basic search so that you can go in and just search on certain keywords. There's advanced search. So I can say, really, go in and I can specify certain notebooks, tags, terms in that, as, as well as dates. And, mo and most of these searches are, uh, by default, they do uh, an uh, Boolean search. So example is I search for, you, you, like I get an alert in my SIM that says, hey, this IP is trying to uh, log in, and, and we lock them out. So then maybe I go into my log, my logger file, and I, I, I can look for some, some stuff there. Um, but in doing this search, maybe I find a note that about this IP from OS int that may, maybe from like a month ago. So then I can search like, all right, that was a, a month ago between this date and that date. Well, let me see, you know, what, what else was going on during that time. So I can use the search date ranges to go in and just specify those date ranges and see, you know, what new indicators popped up from the open source Intel sources uh, or, or just situational awareness stuff, news and stuff that was going on. You know, did new vulnerabilities come out? Did new e exploits come out? Things like that. So then what this has evolved into essentially is, you know, obviously this isn't going to scale for an enterprise, but it was really like what I was talking about initially, where doing the quick and dirty first to find out what your needs are. And so basically came up, and, and, and I guess these could be your requirements, where you could come up with like a, a um, metadata framework of, hey, these are the tags that I want to use. So you're using the, ever, the, uh, the secret weapon categories of you know, when, what, when, where, who, and then you have your different notebooks here. And then you basically come, come up with a tagging hierarchy of how you want to use that. 
Um, and, and you can see, like, I've defined, you know, when is maybe, like, priority, confidence, what is your data type, where is your workflow or, or state, and then lastly, who. And then this is some of the other ideas that I threw in, too, where you're talking about doing the same thing except for, you know, case tracking, indicator database, adversary database, whatever. And one of the things, too, is, only, like, you don't want to spend a horrendous amount of time, just like all that automatic data that's fed in, like you don't want to really spend an enormous amount of time going back and ta tagging things, because that's all you would would do. But the whole philosophy is on only tag it if it's relevant. I mean, in most other cases, you're just going to do this search, and you'd find stuff that way. And the neat thing here is these, for in the analysis change, you can use like uh, these, this what column here to cross-reference. So you could cross-reference like an adversary to specific indicators, to cases, to open source in, Intel. You know, maybe you got it from an Intel sharing site. Maybe it's related to a specific log set, et cetera. So you can, you know, come up, you know, basically search, do a search on one tag and come up with everything you know about that particular person. Now, these last two, I haven't, I don't have any need for that, but um, just from what I've seen people do around industry, that's how you could use it. But the thing is, is you could use this meta structure to, um, you know, do like maybe implement it in Splunk, uh, do Elk Stack, that, that, that seems like the big thing now. You could suck this data into Sims. You could use wikis. I mean, and you could use WordPress, where a category is like a notebook, but but a, and a and a blog post is is a note. You could use SharePoint, or or even something as like just a shared file repository with like note with uh, note do documents. Just anything, because a lot of people are doing nothing, right? And at least if you can start out doing something to determine what you need, and you can use that to, uh, those statistics and those trends to ask for what you need from executive management. But essentially, we, d we just need a bucket that can suck in date, data, supports tagging, and allows me to search through it, and I got a simple Intel management system. Um, so just some future ideas that I'm having. Most of this is really focused on, you know, trying to do more interesting things with some of the OS int stuff through scripting and stuff to automate it. Um, some interesting ideas are just doing some API automation. So you could create an app that basically goes into Evernote and does, maybe it looks for IPs, and then it would um, auto-tag those as an example. So you do cool stuff like that, where there's a lot of third-party apps, like there's a diary app, right? And the diary app is, it basically uses Evernote as its backend database. So you could come up with maybe like a third party app that would look like maybe like an incident re response tool, but it would just be using Ev Evernote as the backend. So in the conclusion, um, you know, one, one of the things is, you know, there's lots of point solutions that are out there, but one of the big things that I see is that there's no central place. Like, you need to get all that da data into one central place. And then you also need to figure out how to organize it. So really, you know, starting out with Ev Evernote as your quick and dirty, uh, you know, maybe it'll meet your needs. If you're a small group, you know, of like 10 folks, Maybe that'll meet your, your needs. Or maybe you're a huge enter, enterprise. At least it gives you a starting point to determine what you can do internally first, find where your gaps are, and then that's whenever you go out and maybe try to partner with your uh, threat intelligence provider. So you use that information to fill those gaps. And getting back to that, that, um, that example that I gave where they went out and built this, this hiring system 
and nobody used it. So I went back like a year later and I'm talking to the ma manager and I'm, I'm like, hey, what's, how the, how's the hiring system going? And she basically said, oh, well, I created it. And so this is like a senior manager per person. And I'm thinking like, you created it? So then she showed me and she basically just, there was a shared drive and she basically just created a hiring full folder and had a folder for each one of her workflow steps and she, as a candidate would proceed through, she would just move it on. Um, so I just want to give a huge thanks to BrewCon. I've had an awesome time here, so thanks for having me, guys. Um, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, Grex. I, my personal blog is novainfosec.com, and there, there's a Twitter for that too. If you want to contact me, this is that form, but if you really want to contact me directly, it's just grex at novainfosec.com. So I usually upload these slides to, you know, SlideShare or whatever, and I don't know who's scra scraping those, but, but that's all that I have. Are there any questions? Okay, go, yeah. Yeah, um, I just, one thought that just struck me along the way, because um, we started out with quick and dirty and keeping it simple. Yeah, yeah. But this has got to cost you an awful lot of time. You know, this yep. looks, you've built an awesome tool set and it's getting pretty complex. Yeah, it, so it is. So can you really say this is quick and dirty or simple anymore? I think, yeah, I mean, that's a good, Good question. I mean, it, it, it is a fairly complex system, um, but, you know, it's, it's really just me doing it, where if you were implementing, like, a real solution or if you were to purchase a product to do this, you would be talking huge amounts of resources. So it's all relative. And the nice thing is, you know, I've created this for you. Take it. Do it. You don't have to recreate the wheel. So you know, take my lessons learned and create your own thing. And it doesn't have to be in Evernote. It could be in your local Elk stack in Splunk or whatever, you know. So, any other questions? I know. This one there. Um, first of all, I love the talk. Um, when I was previously working for a well-known SIM vendor, I tried to um, drive a project almost exactly like this. Okay. So that's, I like it. Thanks. Why, what are you doing with the structured data formats like, like your stick stuff? I saw FSI yeah, stuff up yeah. there and so on. How do you integrate those data points? Well, that's a future, that's an area that, that I would want to incorporate. I haven't really investigated that too deep yet. Um, but like there's tools like um, SIF, I've looked at, and there's another one, I'm blanking on the name right now, but um, it's for managing indicators. But it's, and uh, what's the, um, there's another tool out there that has about 100 open source Intel feeds, and it's by the folks that do Bro. I um, can't remember the name of it, but, but I played around with that. I mean, and that's, ah, like, you, you could definitely suck that in, and, 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 and at least conceptually, I know, I know that I could suck it in and, and do that. I guess, like, I have to figure out, you know, is that gonna help me? Because a lot of this, the, uh, I, I guess, XML structured data, as an analyst, that may help, help me, it may not. Because it, it doesn't, all that data doesn't give, give me context as an analyst that's investigating an incident. I think the sticks and the taxi, and I think there's another acronym. I think it's great for, you know, you have this threat Intel feed and, and you can merge everything together and automatically put it out to your IDS or your IPS systems. Um, the only problem that I, like if I was running the network, I would have an issue with that because I would, like, I don't just want to take this feed and just dump stuff out there. Um, but I guess I'm looking at it as more of an, like it, we, we could incorporate that in there. Um, at least it, it could be done, but I, I don't necessarily see a reason for it. But like 
I said, it is something that I'm looking at using the tools like SIF and, and, and a few other, other ones that I mentioned. Now, the other thing that you can incorporate, which I didn't even mention, right? So once you go through this whole process and you figure out where your Intel gaps are, that's when you bring in the commercial vendors and, and you say, hey, these are my gaps. Can, can you fill those gaps? And then you can probably wouldn't be using Evernote, but then you can take their threat Intel feeds pump it into Evernote or Splunk or whatever to fill those gaps. Uh, follow on question, I'm sorry for hogging the mic. It seems like you've built a really critical business function around um, an off-prem. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Evernote just like killed, what did they kill, like 400 FTE positions last week? Um, I see like the value proposition, but yeah. I would feel much better with an on-prem oh, version. I agree, right? This gets back to the quick and dirty, right? Hey, I'm gonna figure out what I need. You, you know, develop this whole structure so that now when I wanna build, when, it, when, it, when I go to a certain size that I wanna build my internal system, I, I already have a framework that I'm gonna build it from. And then that can help me choose the right product that is gonna help me because I know the type of data that I need and that I'm gonna put into the system. But yeah, I totally agree. For a huge enterprise, don't use Evernote, come on. Also, don't use SharePoint. <laughs> use, you, you, use SharePoint, right? <laughs> I think there was one question over there. Hey, uh, just a quick question. So, mm -hmm. you've, you've put in a lot of data where you've not touched on the kind of quality of data and quality of analysis. Yeah. Do you have any tips, tricks, or whatever lessons learned about, you know, um, managing quality for your threat intel? Like some of that is, it's like great that people tell yeah. me about Zoostrucker. It's probably not very important. You know, yeah. you, how do you manage quality? Do you have well, any good lessons? I think, I mean, my philosophy is, at least initially, I don't f care about qual quality. Just give me the data right and let me store it right i can determine if it's good or not later when i'm investigating an incident and i can see like oh look this this piece of this indicator that i got from this feed is relevant and this is right so then i can go back and use there's a tagging structure for quality there so i can say oh this is high quality medium quality low um, but by default it's just assumed low but um and then you could trend that over time and, and see, well, on the cases that we're investigating, you know, we tend to be using this feed more and it's relevant to us. So you could trend that over time and uh, use that to maybe weight, you know, this feed more than, more than uh, that feed. But yeah, quality is hard. The best quality, personally, I think is gonna be like if you have, like is gonna be I internally generated data. So if you have like honeypots or whatever, I mean, I mean that's gonna be really relevant. But the thing is, is this gets you started so that you can pivot off stuff and eventually get towards, you know, building an, I an indicator data database that, that's really re relevant to your specific organization. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, yeah. So it's, there is no, it's work is, is what it is, right? So <laughs> there's, no, there, there's no easy solution for it. You, you gotta put in the hours and, I mean, that's what, like what Dave Kennedy was talking about this morning where it comes back to, pe to people, you know? Like you can buy all these tools and you can set them up but you know, no one's using them, no one's monitoring them. You know, it comes back to the people that are using those tools to do their job. So, any other questions? Go ahead. I think. So, uh, you, like you mentioned that like, you're drawn in a lot of this data, like open source data, and that's, that's good, but I think all these feeds, the problem is you're not really getting a lot of good context from these feeds. So a lot of them are gonna give you IPs, they're gonna give you stuff, but if you look at like the pyramid of pain, like 
on the top of that is your TTP. So yeah, exactly. If you're, if you're aware of a specific threat actor and the TTPs that they use, like say if you have in your environment and you see particular things happening that you associate with a particular threat actor, yeah, and you already have intelligence, not just like different stuff yeah. scattered all over the place, but a bunch of stuff that tells you if you see this along with this and this, yep. then you can combine it into say, okay, we need to look for this in our environment. And where that comes into effect is with the analysis of that threat intelligence data, yep. which is like the best ways that I've seen it done is basically, it's like, tr don't get me wrong, everyone has value in this open source arena, but where you're looking at, you have a bunch of intelligence from incidents where you've seen this type of actors performing and you build a true database which links indicators together in yep. an intelligent way to say, okay, this IP is strongly associated with this actor or this data set. Exactly, you can build yeah. stuff like the adversary database that you're talking about, basically, in that. But building that in Evernote, I think, could be a little bit tricky. I, so I just wanted to make it clear to people that, say, this is good for open source intelligence, and it'll get you so far. But if you really want to know, like, what's happening in your environment, you're dealing with, like, serious threats and stuff, you could have, you know, some difficulties building the correct intelligence on it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. I think part of it is, and I don't know if I kept this slide, but like there's a lot of stuff in your organization that's going on, and the big problem, like open source Intel is only gonna take you so, so far, but you know, there's like your case tracking system, there's your internal logs. Ideally, you would be, um, like you're, you have to do the work and put in the analysis time using the information that, it, at least at this point, is centralized so that you can go up to the top of the stack and build those TTPs. So it could be done, I think, but you know, this is only Evernote. I'm not suggesting, like, if, if you don't have nothing, Evernote's a great place to start. Learn what you need, right? Eventually, you're gonna, through this process, you're gonna determine what your true requirements are, and that can help you buy the right enterprise solutions. But this is just a way to start out for people that are doing nothing, right? Just to, so that, to give that, you know, this whole, this whole thing started with me as an analyst trying to understand, like, an alert pops, and I basically have enough, nowhere to go, right? At least, you know, using something like this can, can help me at least give me some data points that maybe I can pivot off of and can bring me back. But you know, currently, if you don't have anything, I think this is great. It's a great way to get started. So I think I'm out of time. So uh, anyway, thank you. Thanks to BrewCon once again.